so much. Thank you, thank you. And in fact, let's, whilst we've got these clap out, let's give a huge round of applause to Virginia for being such a fabulous MC for the day. And hopefully in a moment, I'll be saying to our techn technology guys too as well. Hello guys, and welcome. Um, look, when I was thinking about what to call this presentation, a few alternate uh, titles came to mind. Uh, the first was this one. <laughs> Why safety is a sexy new buzzword in organisations, in our dreams. <laughs> what safety and fun have in common? Absolutely nothing. And my personal favourite, what safety, safety in HR, the most popular peeps within business. And other delusions we like to tell ourselves. Now, folks, uh, as an ex-HR leader myself in, you know, little businesses such as Bunnings, and McDonald's, you know, I'm just being real here, right? Um, because unlike some of those other leadership titles within organisations, we've heard some of them today, haven't we? The data scientists, the creative directors, you know, the ones with the really sexy titles. I kind of feel like HR and safety, well, we're a little bit lower on the who you want to hang out with at the office Christmas party pecking order. Now, for any of my HR kind of safety colleagues in the room, no need to take this personally, because clearly I feel like you're awesome. And look, if you're not, to, to, if you're not near someone, turn to the person next to you or behind you, give them a little shake and say, I think you're awesome, because I think you're awesome. And this poor guy down the front, I think you're awesome, even though you're by yourself down there. You're, you know you're awesome, beautiful, good, good, good. Because it's not about who you are. Yeah, it's not about who you are as a person, but it's what this role has kind of become known for over the years, right? Somewhere along the line, we've been known as the fun police. <laughs> now, I'm fun. Are there any fun police in the house? This is where you point at other people, right? Okay, no, I can't see any pointing right here. Um, or the straighty 180s, where we're so, you know, with our clipboards and our checklists. Or sometimes even the corporate Gestapo, where it's all around, you know, compliance, compliance, compliance. Somewhere on the line, this safety in HR role has kind of become, we've become safety enforcers. And this is where we've gone wrong. So anyway, I conformed to the more conservative title of creating a culture of safety. One, because I'm very conscious it's the afternoon and I actually wanted you to rock up, so thank you for those of you who are still here. And two, because I didn't want to offend you too much too soon before we'd even met in person. Because a word of warning, I might say some things this afternoon that, I don't know, that might offend or perhaps that chicks shouldn't apparently say, um, particularly when I get really passionate. My, my um, little nickname tends to be Potty Mouth. So let's just break the ice right now. I know it's probably the only thing between you and a drink is probably me. So let's turn to the person next to you or behind you and repeat after me. So let's do that first. Let's find someone, turn to them and repeat after me. Say, shit, this girl's interactive. <laughs> oh yes, yes I am. <laughs> now folks, you can kind of get that, you know, the perspective I bring today, it's a little fresh. It might be a little straight shooting. I'm not particularly thinking I'm gonna be winning popularity contests. But leadership isn't about popularity, right? Leadership isn't about taking the easy road either. Leadership is about taking the right road, yeah? And if we're serious about creating change to be fit for the future and all this fabulous stuff that we heard about today, this workplace is gonna look nothing like the workplace of today. If we're serious about creating change so that we can optimise performance, optimise well-being, and ultimately get people on our safety quest, then I kind of reckon we need to shake things up a little bit. Because what some of us are doing just isn't working. Yeah. Traditionally, we've been a little too scared sometimes to rock the boat within whether it's big corporates or big government departments. Sometimes leaders struggle to have those tough chats with some of their teams who are behaving poorly or maybe indulging in some of these unsafe acts, sometimes because they've been around forever, and others because they're the ones who are actually getting the results, right? And the question I have is, how has that worked for us? Because, you know, whether we like it or not, I reckon that there are riots going on within some of our organisations right underneath your nose and your team's nose every day. Now, when I talk about riots, I don't mean the traditional riot, you know, like the stop work meeting or the, the violent upheaval. No, 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 because as you guys know, the people riots that are happening these days, they're far more subtle, aren't they? But they're often really, really detrimental in the way people feel about coming to work. They obviously affect wellness and definitely performance. So let me share with you very quickly what some of these people riots that I'm talking about look like. And you may, 
You might recognise some of these, maybe in your workplace, if they're in the room, probably refrain from pointing this time, yeah? Um, first people write, the I'm entitled type. These are the people that, well, it's all about, well, what are you going to give me, yeah? What are you going to do for my career? What is HR and leadership going to do to fix that safety issue? Rather than focusing on the really important role that they play in the employment relationship. The I'm entitled type, these are the ones that know exactly how many sick days they have left. They wake up in the morning and they think, well, you know what, I better use them or lose them, right? The I'm entitled type. Then we have the checked out people, right? These are the ones who are present, yeah, they rock up, but they're physically and emotionally checked out. Yeah. Us Aussies like to call this, I guess, the Aussie bludger, and we have, over the years, mastered this people riot. Um, are there any Kiwis in the room? Any Kiwi friends in the room? Oh, hello. I'm not going to slag you off. I'm actually going to give you some credit, actually, because you've got to pay this one from our friends across the ditch. What are you doing this weekend? I'm putting up a retaining wall. Do it yourself? No, I'm going to get some broken. Oh, come on, mate, do it yourself. She's pretty big job. Oh, you'll be right. You reckon? We can knock it over in half a day. Yeah, get a couple of mates around. Hey, Josie! Huh? Give us a hand with the job Saturday. Mate, you're dreaming. <laughs> Aussies. Oh, no surprises to you. You gotta pay that one. Now the 21st century bludger or people riot in this sense can, can be masturbated in all different shapes and forms, right? Obviously the slack ass smoker has often copped most grief over the years, but for the non-smokers in the room, perhaps you're not exempt. Have you ever come across the social butterfly? These are the ones who are present, all right. They're kind of flittering around the office all day, interrupting you and everyone else while you're trying to do your work. Or perhaps it's the time lagger. These are the people who rock up late, but don't worry, they make up for it because they leave early. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're left to pick up all their slack. Then do not be fooled by the busy beaver. Do you know these ones? These are the people who are so busy that they cannot leave their desk. They're there from morning till night. They don't even stop to have lunch. They're busy, all right. They're busy checking social media, doing social media updates. They're busy surfing the net. They're sometimes busy trading shares. How can we forget the Macquarie banker that was busy being caught busy on national TV? Reserve Bank's obviously deemed that it wants to wait and see to see the effects of the last three rate rises that it's put in place late last year. And sometimes this takes up to uh, you know six to nine months before they actually see that effect. All right, Martin, thanks for that. <laughs> Sprung! Oh, and of course, there's the energy thief. This is the real one that you know. This person, you, you know, it's been a fabulous weekend, and you say, "How are?" You and how do they respond? <sighs> exactly. You go, how was your weekend? <sighs> Want a pay rise? <sighs> you know, so they rock up, but they're kind of checked out. They're checked out people, right? Then we have the over and out. These are the people that actually get up, leave your teams, leave your organizations. This is where turnover comes in. Then we've got the people that are too busy playing the blame game. I call these the blamers. Yeah, these are the whingers. These are the ones where nothing is ever their fault. They're the ones too busy pointing their fingers at everyone and everything else as to why there was a safety incident, rather than obviously looking for a solution. Now again, get ready. Yes, you're about to be interactive, so I'm giving you some warning this time. Get ready, because we're going to get our best blamer faces on. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is what a good blamer face looks like. So let's everyone get their pointy fingers out and their best blamer face. And everyone, if you like, you can just point at me and say, it's all your fault. Well, that's piss poor. Let's try that again. All right, are we going to do it again? It's all your fault. Yeah, I know it's my fault that I'm keeping you between drinks. But every time, my mum once said to me, every time you point your finger at someone else, look down and you've always got three pointers, fingers pointing back at you. The blamers. Then, of course, there is the power trippers. These are the bullies within our organisations. Yeah, And I spent a lot, of my, a lot of my life talking about bullying. I run a program around bullying. And these are the bullies because fact of the matter is bullies kill business. And they can kill people because what happens is a bully comes in and because they feel insignificant and insecure, they swear at you when you make a mistake, they belittle you, they take all the credit for your hard work. Yeah. Anyone seen this movie? It's gone back a number of years now, like 10 or 15 years now, The Old Devil Wears Prada. How can we forget Meryl Streep in this movie, right? She plays the epitome of the bully boss. 
Yeah, she's got her little assistant there at her beck and call. And I'm sorry for those of you who haven't seen this because I'm about to ruin it, but it's not until the end of this movie where the target faces up to her bully boss where the tables change. Yeah, and that's a real challenge with this topic. But I know this is a you know, Hollywood movie, but you just have to pick up the papers, look at statistics, People Matters reports, all that stuff, to see that bullying is a perceived problem in this country. And it comes in all different shapes and forms. Sometimes it's sideways, sometimes it's upwards bullying. Yeah? Statistically, though, the bully boss is the one that gets the most flack. So here's the thing, guys. Here we are trying to desperately rid our schoolyards of bullying and cyberbullying and all that stuff, and yet they're hanging out you know, they're growing up and they're hanging out in our organisations. And the really sad part is 50% of people that have been bullied will pack up and quit. And 37% will actually stay and do nothing. I'm not sure what's worse. Yeah. And 65% of people will feel the effects of bullying five years later. Bullying absolutely kills business. Let's quickly go through the other ones. Then there's the talk down people, right? This is where everyone at every opportunity will talk you down. They'll slag you off as their boss. They'll, you know, talk badly about your team. They'll talk badly about your organisation. Now, back in my day, it used to be at a barbecue. Nowadays, what do they do? They jump online and they kind of talk down to their thousands of, you know, social media followers. Then we've got the change resistors. These are the ones who will desperately do anything to hang on to the status quo, and they can often make our life hell in the process. Then there is the me mindset, the competitive mindset. This is the person who's all around me, 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 and it's all around me versus you. And they'll often you know, try to win at all costs. We've then got the thought keepers. These are the ones in your teams who have got abundance of experience. They might have been, you know, the person who's known that system for 20 years. They've been around. They're brilliant at what they do. But again, they're keeping it all in here and not sharing it with their teams or anyone else in the organisation for that matter. We then see the little clones, yeah, the little teams which are all little mini-me's of each other. They all think the same. They all look the same. They all act the same. And it's all about uni uniformity. We see disconnected teams or disconnected cultures. And when we're disconnected, it's because, again, it's all about me. And finally, that command control start that we, we spoke about today that we know just doesn't work, where it's all about top-down, one-way communication downwards. These are just some of the people rights that we might see happening in our organisations, which obviously lead to often unsafe acts, but definitely unsafe environments. Now, in a fabulous book, Bullies, Blamers and Bludgers, written by my husband's wife. Thank you. Um, now, I explore the extent of damage that, these, that some of these people rights have on you know, individuals, but obviously the economy. I mean, you'd know this stuff. Oh, you guys are in the room are the ones that generate some of these statistics, right? It's frightening. Uh, and if you've ever been part of it, you'd know this personally yourself. But let's just look at a couple. 90 million sick days us Aussies take per year. And if you break that down between private and public, 9.5 9 days on average in the private sector and another couple of days in the public sector. That's costing in excess of $44 billion in absenteeism. It's just crazy. The average cost of mental stress claims, $342,000. Bullying, anywhere between six and 36 billion. I know there's a big discrepancy there, but anything with a billion to it, it's a big number. And 38% of public servants said because of bullying and harassment, they were unable to return to work. So I don't even know what the cost of that is, right? It is unbelievably astounding. No wonder we want to step into our safety enforcer roles. You know, this, this, this is just not okay. In our safety enforcer roles, though, what do we use? We use words like this, don't we? Compliant, non-compliant, defect, penalty. All these words is the words we throw around as our safety enforcer roles. We use influencing strategies like policy and procedure say this, legislation says this, our safety system says this. And then we wonder why we don't get a lot of buy-in. As safety enforcers, where we go wrong is we tell people what to do, we enforce the rules, and then we overcomplicate this stuff, right? Paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Now, don't get me wrong, that stuff is critical. That's the what part of our safe environment, yeah? The what, the safety processes, the safety systems, what's our policies and procedures, all that stuff, a really, really critical part of your safe environment, but it's not the only part. 
Your team need to know the answer to this though. And this is a question your team need to know. What is our safety system? Give me some clarity on that. And what are we aiming for? If we're not communicating that, then they're gonna be doing stuff, but is it right? So this is really important, but alone it's not enough. The safety system, and we heard about this today, about designing some of this stuff, it needs to be business as usual, not bolted on the side. And when you have organisations that build this as part of their processes and, and the way we do business, that's when it starts to become, you know, they're, they're part of their safety environment. Now, back to the what. The what part speaks to our head. So everyone give me a wave with their left hand for a minute. All the way out the back there, I can see you. Yeah, beautiful, thank you, you're participating. Give me a wave with your left hand. And I want you to do this. What is our safety system? That means repeat it, yep. What is our safety system? Thank you. Um, I know it's late. Um, the what part speaks to our head, yeah? That's the logical bit. Yes, that makes sense, that makes sense. Yep, logically that makes sense. But that's why alone it doesn't drive behaviour. But more on that later. I don't know about you, but when I'm surrounded by some of those people rights, those toxic behaviours, those unsafe acts, I just wish in that moment that I could morph into Adam Sandler, right? Does anyone, has anyone seen the movie Click? Okay, don't, don't get it out on Netflix, it's pretty crap. But let me just explain the movie. There's no wedding singer. But in this movie, he is this middle-aged guy who's not happy with his life. He gets like a remote control. And in that moment, he can click in that moment, pause his real life and do stuff in that moment that he wished, only wished that he could do in his real life. So sometimes when I'm surrounded by some of these toxic behaviours or unsafe behaviours, I just wish for a moment I could morph into Adam Sandler. This is what I'm talking about. Whoa, cowboy. I said, land the Watsahita account, you'll get promoted. I didn't mean right this second. But I already told my wife, sir. I spent money I don't have. To do these documents, it's gonna take me months. And you better get started. <laughs> wow, I just got a big headache. All right, so Adam Sandler does kind of angry better than most, but here's the thing, I'm not advocating violence, but sometimes you might have heard that saying, when neurons fire together, they wire together. What does that mean? It means sometimes we're doing habitually some of these crappy behaviours, unsafe behaviours, without even knowing it. And we need someone or something to be able to help us snap us out of it. So ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you what is formally known as a clapper, as your very own slapper. Yes, hopefully as you walked into the room, did you all get yourself a little, a little slapper? Yes, let's get it out. Let me explain. Good, 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 good. This little tool comes in handy for all sorts of things, right? Not only for when you're falling asleep a little bit later and giving yourself a little uppercut, but this little tool, when you see someone or you're, you're even finding yourself indulging in some of those unproductive behaviours, you get your little slapper out and you give yourself a little uppercut. If you see someone and they're about to do a shortcut and they're not gonna put their PPE on, yeah, I've worked in retail, you get your little slapper out and you give them a little uppercut, right? And so let's face it, it's also about the only time we can be called a slapper and be proud of it. So, um, Virginia did say, I'm gonna get you on your feet, so that's about time to do that. Let's all stand up with our slappers in our right hand. We're standing up with slappers in our right hand. And in a moment, if I didn't have heels on, I'd come up there and I'd slap a couple of people who aren't, who aren't standing up. So we're gonna get our slappers in our right hand. In a moment, on the count of three, when I say three, we're gonna say, I'm a slapper and I'm proud. And we're gonna slap these as proud as possible. Are we ready? On the count of three, one, two, three. I'm a slapper and I'm proud. Beautiful. And yes, disclaimer, not to be used on small children or animals. Um, look, your challenge or our challenge is really this. How do we actually start to influence some of these right behaviours so that you can be fit for the future, so that you can create a safe environment, so that people can be innovative, collaborative, all these words that we use. Unless there's a safe environment, it's just not gonna happen. So very quickly, I wanna share with you the flip side of what those behaviours look like very, very quickly. All right, so instead of the I'm entitled type, we need people who are resilient. Let's do this, right? We need people who not only rock up to work and are just physically there, but they're absolutely checked in and they're really, really productive whilst they're there. Wouldn't it be great if you had people who are advocates for your team, for your organisation, saying, you know what, we're doing great stuff here. 
and you've got people wanting to work in your team where they go and sign me up, I want to work for them. We certainly don't want the blamers. We need people at all different levels who have the leadership mindsets that are willing to say, you know what, yep, I made that mistake or that was, my, that was on my watch, but more importantly, this is what I'm going to do differently. We don't want the bullies. We need people to be enabling and empowering our people. There's absolutely no way you are going to be successful in your safety quest if people do not feel empowered to speak up, empowered to say, you know what, no, that's actually not okay. So this one's really critical. We want people to talk up about you to others. You know, we want them to talk up about the things that you're doing and be excited about the future. We certainly need people who are willing to challenge the status quo. We've kind of seen that throughout all of today, who are willing to look for better ways, smarter ways to do things. We definitely want to go from that, you know, that, that competitive mindset to that collaborative mindset where it becomes all around we rather than all about me. We need the thought leaders to look at better, better ways to do things. You know, what's happening out there in industry? What can we learn? And then put that into our own teams and our own organisations. We definitely need people to feel like they're bringing their whole selves to work and, and absolutely that they're respected. When we can start, when we really build connected teams and organisations, that's when they're very clear on all about why. And we heard that today with David talking about the purpose stuff. That's really, really critical. And finally, we need organisations where it's this every which way communication, getting feedback sideways, upwards, downwards, every which way. So how? That's the question. You know, in terms of your safety quest, there's two things that we really need to get good at. One, we need to understand what's driving some of that behaviour, because if we don't understand it, we're going to pull the wrong levers, right? And the second thing is, what's a simple little tip to be able to get your people to connect where they want to be on, on, on board with your safety quest? And that's what I want to share with you now. So let's quickly look at what's driving the behaviour. Yeah, we've looked at this pointy finger before. Um, again, you're all control freaks, right? Not just your boss or your wife, but you're all control freaks. What do I mean by that? Let's explore. Well, you, you're maybe not a control freak, but your brain's a control freak. And let's look at how that plays out in terms of behaviour. The challenge for us, guys, is that our brain is not designed for the 21st century workplace. What do I mean by that? If you look actually at the architecture of the brain, it hasn't changed that much over thousands of years. The human brain has, but the rest hasn't. Meanwhile, you're operating in this VUCA world. Probably a term you may have heard. It's a term coined by the US military that stands for this. Volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. That's the environment that you're operating in. Is that fair to say? So we're operating in this VUCA world with a brain that was kind of designed for thousands of years ago. So what does that mean? Well, there's two primary goals of the brain. Does anyone want to give a crack as to what one is? Yes, I heard over here. Yeah, the, the primary goal is obviously survival, yeah? Otherwise, we're not here. And the second, does anyone know? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> to feel good, if you call that feeling good. But um, yeah, to feel good, right? So we want, to, we want to move away from threat and we want to move towards reward. But of course, because survival trumps, we default to, to avoid threat first and foremost. I read a book called Idiot Brain. It's from a neuroscientist who was actually very funny uh, called um, Dean Burnett. And in it, he says, our brains are control freaks. So not you, but our brain is a control freak. Why? Because from an evolutionary point of view, anything that is uncertain is a potential threat. And so it wants to minimise that threat and it wants answers. Now, let's use this quick example for you to think about. This is like an everyday situation for me living in Sydney and probably down here now in Melbourne. Let's imagine this scenario very, very quickly, guys. You tomorrow, let's imagine you, um, you're tasked to, to speak at a conference like this and everyone's come to see you, right? A thousand people of your colleagues are coming to see you at this presentation. So the first scenario is this. You hit bumper to bumper traffic, boom, boom, a bit like Sydney and Melbourne daily and you just know you're not going to make it. You actually then, you've blown a tyre and you're definitely not going to make it. Second scenario is you've hit that bumper to bumper traffic, but then you get that little bit of hope, you know, you move a couple of cars, and so you keep doing that kind of moving up, edging forward. They're the two scenarios. Not, oh no, Blythe, that wouldn't happen because I would have stayed at the venue. That's not the scenario to choose from here. The first scenario is you definitely know you're not going to make it because you've just blown out, or the, the second scenario is you might make it 
Okay, it's touch and go. Very quickly, just turn to the person next to you or behind you. Which out of those two scenarios do you find more stressful? One or two. Very, very quickly, there's no right or wrong, just have a quick 20 second chat. All right, show of hands if you found scenario one more stressful, that you know you're not going to make it. It's hard to see up here. This is what rock stars have. Yeah, okay, so I can see a couple of hands up there. Show of hands if you found scenario two. Big show of hands. Wow, okay. Yeah, okay. Wow. So for those of you who couldn't see, that's probably about 97% of the room found number two more stressful. How interesting. Number one is not a good outcome. It's actually bad news, right? You're not going to make it. People are there to see you. And yet, whenever I ask this question, 97, 98% of the audience say they find number two more stressful. Interesting. From a scientific point of view, and this is really interesting to think about with yourself, but also your teams, no news is actually worse than bad news. Yeah, right? No news, scenario two, not knowing whether you're going to make it, that touch or go, you know, the adrenaline starts pumping, all that kind of stuff, is actually worse than bad news. Scenario one was bad news, you're not going to make it. But it allows us then to do what? Start to plan and start to get some certainty around it. Yeah? The brain is a control freak. It wants to have the answers and it needs to know things now. This is not ideal when we're living in a VUCA world where uncertainty reigns supreme. Every organisation I'm working with at the moment, it's kind of like, yeah, well, I was working with that leader. Well, they're gone because there was a redundancy and there's a restructure here. Like, we don't know what's around the corner. So you can imagine this is wreaking havoc on our brain. So the, the other thing to be mindful of here is our teams also have questions that need answered, whether we know that or not, or whether they even know that or not, in terms of their safety quest. And of course, the brain needs the answer now. And if we don't answer it, they'll simply fill the void. One of those questions I've already spoken about, what's our safety system and what are we aiming for? If, we don't, if we're not really upfront about that and give them clarity, they're going to do stuff, but are they kind of hit or miss? I'm going to share with you the other couple of questions, but before we do, let's have a quick look at what the impact of this threat and fear has on us, yeah? Because that's really critical in terms of understanding what drives people's behaviour. Now, if lots of things can trigger fear in us humans. Show of hands quickly if this one triggers a little, any fear at you at all, the thought of being that person having to get up on stage here. I can see a few hands of that one. All right. What about this one? You know, heights or clowns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm more the clowns. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you and the clowns. This one, thought of one of these little creepy crawlies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got to be really honest here, guys. This is me when I see a cockroach, right? Do you, do you get them in Melbourne, those big cockroaches? I was in Tassie the other day and they look, no, you don't. See, this is why I shouldn't live in, on the northern beaches. I'm talking those things that are about two inches big, right? This is me. I'll, I'll tell a quick story of how ridiculous this is, but there is a reason why I share this. So the other night I was about to hop in bed and I've got a, I've got a bedside table and I'm literally, I was so tired. I was literally about to stumble in and I come face to face with this cockroach, two, two inches. And no word of a lie, I literally freeze because that's what I do when I get into fear mode. So then I'm in a dilemma, right? Because my husband's out in the other room, everyone else is asleep in the bedroom, he's watching something. So I'm yelling out to him, I'm like, Maz, Maz. No, no response. Thinking, well, I can't turn around and get him because what happens when you turn around? It's gone. And then I'm, then I'm in all sorts of trouble. So I'm screaming, he comes running, he's like, yes, watch. And I'm like, you need to sort that out. And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, yes, sort it out. So anyway, no word about it. He sprays like a whole can of maltine on this cockroach. Then it goes flying. It's like going 100 miles an hour. It goes into my set of drawers. So I'm now on the bed going, yep, yep, you need to just get out. I'm not going to bed until I see a body. So he's pulling everything out. He's like, you saw me spray. I'm like, no, get it. He's pulling everything out. Nowhere to be seen. So then he's had it. He's like, I'm going. He's, he's gone back to the watch his TV. And I'm like, I'm in a massive dilemma now. Like, I saw him spray it, but I saw it go in there. What do I do? And so what does every good mother do? I've walked into my daughter's bedroom, who was next door, sound asleep. That's so beautiful when they're sleeping. And I picked her up, popped her into my bed, tucked her in, and I went and slept in her bed. And I had a fabulous night's sleep. 
<laughs> now, the, the body did rock up a couple of days later. Now, I share this because... <laughs> Because I know rationally, and this is no word of blood, I know rationally that, that, that my response to that cockroach is actually ridiculous. I know that rationally. But for whatever reason, and it's a long, long story I won't bore you with, my brain triggers into threat mode whether that threat is real or perceived. And that is critical that we understand that. The brain responds to threats whether they're real or perceived. So in the workplace, there's plenty of stuff that could be real threats, real physical threats. Or perhaps there's psychological threats that are perceived and straight away that could trigger people into that threat mode. So let's then have a look at what that means. There's lots of different responses. What's obviously happening is when we're in fear mode, it, it trips the amygdala, right? The little almond shaped part of the brain there. It gets complete priority over the brain. Um, that's the survival part of the brain. That's great if that was actually, you know, a survival. In my case, obviously the cockroach wasn't. But obviously what's happening there is all the blood flow and oxygen is going to the emotional part of the brain, not the prefrontal cortex, not this bit, not the bit where you have to be thinking, being creative, being innovative, producing results, all that stuff. So it's, and that's why you know, people start to make silly, silly mistakes when they're environments of fear, yeah? You'll hear people say, I just can't think straight. Or, you know, you've, you've probably been in an interview yourself where you're like, oh my God, I just, I couldn't just, I couldn't find the answer. Because again, the oxygen isn't going to that prefrontal cortex. And in fact, the way I think of it is this, the moment that amygdala is tripped, that activation in the limbic system, the emotional center, creates a deactivation in the prefrontal cortex, the human brain. This is everywhere where collaboration, creativity, performance is all here. Really, really critical. We actually get dumber. There's lots of reports on this to actually show we get much, much dumber when our amygdala gets tripped. What's happening from a chemical point of view? Well, of course, cortisol is being released. And again, that's fine in short doses. But if you think about this in the context of the work environment at the moment, when people are stewing over a problem, they're stewing over all the changes that are happening. They're stewing over not knowing what sorts of things are happening. They're stewing over an alleged bullying situation, whatever it is. Yeah, that cortisol is being released constantly. And that's the issue we're facing in today's workplaces at the moment. And that's leading to all sorts of well-being, obesity, illnesses, all that stuff. It's a real issue. Again, some of those stats that we heard this morning, what I found interesting was the psychological injuries are, are three times more costly they're also three times more time off work than any physical injury. Yeah, so again, some of those stats are that mental health conditions are costing us 20 billion in lost productivity. Frightening. And finally, and the thing that you'd probably see here is how it affects the behaviors. And that's where some of those people riots will start to come out, all because of fear. Yeah, so once we can understand what's driving some of this, we can then start to you know, pull some of those levers. Really quickly, the other week I got a call um, from one of the girls who went to my combat bullying course recently. And so, yes, I give out my phone number, and that's not to try to get friends because I was a HR manager. It's because often people have lots of questions after it, right? And this girl, Kate, called, and she said, Blythe, I don't know if you remember me. Um, I was at the course, and um, she said, I just wanted to let you know that your course changed my life. Now, this is no bullshit. I, I was literally on the phone thinking, I mean, I know it's good, right, but it's not that good. And, and so I just kind of listened and I said, okay. And she said, look, you know, for the last couple of months, I've really been struggling. I've been, my, my manager's been, you know, doing all these bullying behaviors. They've been nitpicking, criticizing me in front of my teammates. I felt really humiliated, all these things. And she said, for the last couple of months, I've been going home with knots in my stomach. I feel physically sick. I've lost all my confidence. She said, and then I'm really disappointed to say that my performances, I've been making mistakes, yada, yada, yada. You get the point. And she said, and just recently, I, you know, I'm not proud to say, but I just started to think, you know, that the only way out was to suicide. So then I'm on the phone just going, oh my God, like, what, where is this going? I, I just was silent. And she said, but you know what? I went to your course and she was really, she was really quiet in my program, which is really interesting. And she said, and you made me realize that actually life can be too short and that I do deserve to come to work and be respected. And I do deserve to feel safe. And I do deserve to be able to do my job to the ability that I know I can do it. So she said, with the support of my husband, I quit. So then I'm thinking, oh God, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And I said, and how do you feel about that? And she said, you know, look, she said, actually, ironically, I'm performing better than I have because she was doing a notice period. She said, for the first time in months, I actually go home and I feel like this weight's off my shoulders and I'm not feeling sick anymore. 
She goes, and the issue is I don't have another job. Do you have any jobs going? And I said, well, we'll talk about that later. Um, so what, why I share that is I could be up here for three hours just telling you stories like Kate's, way worse than even Kate's, because this stuff is so real. You'd know it, you work in it, and if you've ever experienced it, you'd know it more than anything. But what can the data geeks also shed some light on, on actually human performance, really? Um, a few years ago, Google did a project called Project Aristotle. What they wanted to do was, of course, pump lots and lots of money and find out what made some teams soar and be really, really good, and some teams, you know, just kind of be mediocre. So they were trying to really work out the perfect team. So what did they do as, as Google only is? They data, data, data. They looked at all sorts of interesting things. They looked at who the Googlers ate with at lunch at the canteen. They looked at you know, the different traits of leaders in the team. They looked at all sorts of things and they put that data together. And five years and something like $5 million later, they, they came up with what us people in the, I guess, leadership field have, have known for a long time. It had less to do with who was in the team, meaning IQ, because they're all smart there, right? And it had all to do with how the team treated each other, right? The best teams at Google were the ones where psychological safety was number one, where they would listen to each other, they would respect each other's opinion, they felt safe enough to be able to share their emotions, yeah? That was, without a doubt, the best performing teams at Google. So it gets me thinking, going, okay, well, how can we do that? How can we make sure that we're creating that environment for our teammates? for our team if, we, if we're leaders in the room, because that's, that's what it's all about. We can all, accidentally without even know it, be triggering some of those threat, you know, threat responses or reward. We can trigger both. It's just when we start to get really good at this, we can start to go, okay, well, is that behavior creating a threat in my team and what can I do differently? So the second question that we need to answer is how. How do we do things around here in terms of safety? Yeah. If we don't explain that to our teams, and they're going to do stuff, it's just whether or not it's right or not. And when I say that, how is all about the behaviours? How do we, what are the not negotiable behaviours in terms of safety in this organisation? What are the really good behaviours, the desired behaviours? What are the rituals that we do in this organisation around safety? And that's where work design can be really interesting. You know, what do we do around here when there's been a hazard or there's an unsafe act? How do we do things around here? Yeah. If we don't share that, people will do stuff, but it's just whether or not it's the right thing. We can have the what. What's our safety system and what are we aiming for? But if the how, the how we do stuff, is, is contradictory, then our safety quest is absolutely doomed. Just give yourself a little shake because I'm about to tell you an important story. Just do that. Blah, blah, blah. Just go like that for a second. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, good. I like you. You do it. Um, I want to tell you a really important story that really shows this um, in, in reality. Introducing a young gentleman called Alec Meekle. Some of you in the room might have heard this case. Alec was a young 16-year-old boy, really excited, gets his first job as an apprentice out at Bathurst, out down at EDI. And uh, his excitement soon turns into fear. As every day he'd come to work, his supervisor would think it was okay to call Alec an effing useless C. He would then, you know, be doing his job and his supervisor would think it'd be okay that every time Alec made a mistake, he'd put like a big X marks a spot on a mistake chart, you know, reward charts. This was a mistake chart to humiliate Alec in front of his teammates. And he threatened Alec that when he got to the end of this mistake chart, that he'd get raped with a steel dildo. Now, he never got to the end because his family found him hung in his family home. Now, this case riles me up for a whole host of reasons, right? Um, but not, you know, not to mention that the, the manager says, oh, but we had all the policies and procedures. Alec just failed to, to use them. Not to mention that the teammates who would see this stuff day in, day out, right? This is really covert, obvious, sorry, obvious, overt bullying. Their justification for not speaking up was, Oh, we just thought it was joking. We just thought it was a bit of fun. Swearing's just part of how we do stuff here. And we don't, and we have a culture of not dobbing. If we don't, if we can have the what, they had the what, they had the policies, the procedures, everything on paper. But if the how, the unwritten rules of how things really work, if they don't match up, then we're never going to be ever, you know, successful in our safety quest. So the second part of this is sometimes we need to review our rituals. Our, you know, the stuff that we do day in, day out that makes us unique, 
that builds our culture? Are they creating an environment of trust or fear? And if they are, let's just do something differently. Because here's the thing, trust, guys, without a doubt, is the cornerstone of your safety quest. I mentioned this before, your team have to trust you. They have to trust the system. They have to trust that someone will support them. Otherwise, people just put up and shut up. A really great example of a ritual, actually, um, that, that really instills trust and shows that environment of safety is this company called Intuit. They're a software company in the US. I don't know if you've heard of them. Anyway, the CEO created these rituals called When Learning Hurts sessions. And essentially what they were were this. When things didn't go pear-shaped, he'd get the, you know, be in an auditorium like this, have hundreds of his team together, and he'd invite each of the different departments up to share when learning hurts. So perhaps it was a big safety incident. And the team had to get up and share what the incident was, be really, really vulnerable. Not so that they could get their slappers out and give them an uppercut, but the whole preface of that ritual was to say, okay, that's not ideal. More importantly, what do we learn from this? And what are we gonna do differently? You know, the whole point of that ritual was to seek learnings so that they could improve for the future rather than slap them into submission and play that blame game. Sometimes we just have to review our rituals. How are we doing things here? And are they in line to where we wanna go? Because sometimes guys, whether we like it or not, I feel like we leaders, um, you know, are to, can, I'm not going to say to blame, but can be part of the problem here because sometimes we give way too much attention to the very behaviours that we say we don't want in organisations. Let me, let me explain. So everyone, you know, everyone's been to the beach. You know when you're down at the beach, I live at the beach. So you know when you're down at the beach and these seagulls are kind of like, mine, 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 and they're desperately trying to come and get your food, right? So what do we sometimes do to shut up a, 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 a hungry seagull? besides get the slapper out. We, you know, sometimes we, we throw them a chip, right, to try to shut them up. But the moment you throw a chip to an angry seagull or a hungry seagull, what happens? Suddenly it's like out of the birds, you've got every bird on the northern beaches coming up and you've suddenly rewarded that behaviour, yeah? Just like when leaders reward those particular people who are getting results through bullying behaviours. Just like when we reward team members who are un, you know, doing unsafe acts or, or poorly behave because we just want to take the easy road and avoid the conversation or protect ourselves, by doing that, we're actually rewarding the behaviour we say we don't want. And if we do that, then what ends up happening is those unproductive behaviours start to reign in our organisations. And so what we've got to be prepared to do is we've got to stop feeding the birds. And we've got to start rewarding the behaviours that we want to see more of, yeah, in our organisations. We've got to be prepared to take the right road with safety rather than the easy road because it's way easier to avoid it, hope it goes away, you know, take that easier road. And that's what leadership's all about. Reviewing our rituals. Some of the things you might want to think about. What happens when somebody in your organisation, you know, engages in or reports an unsafe act? Do we get our slapper out or do we seek the learning? What happens when someone reports a hazard or they, God forbid, they lodge a grievance? Do we label them a troublemaker or do we support them and support the whole process and investigate it? And finally, what happens when people actually are on stress leave or are on workers' comp? You know, do we treat them like a criminal just because of that one-off person that has taken the system for a ride? And yes, they're out there, I know. Or do we support, do we check in, do we make them feel loved to, to really encourage them to come back to work? Reviewing our rituals is really, really important. How do we do things around here? So we know what, what talks to this, the how. Let's everyone get our right hand this time. Oh no, let's get both the hands actually. Let's get both the hands. Give me double wave, give me double wave, yeah, yeah. So what do we wanna do? How do we do things around here? We wanna minimize risks, that's boo and we want to maximise rewards, yeah? We want to minimise risks and we want to maximise rewards. How do we do things? Are our behaviours and rituals in line with where we need to go? All right, so the final part of today, how do we then connect, right? How do we then connect to people who want to be part of it? They're not forced to be part of it and they have to because we've slapped them into submission, but they actually want to be part of this journey. We know we can't get the slappers out, right, and force them. And we know that the what bit just speaks to their head and that that alone doesn't drive behaviour change. But why? Because the human brain, I always think of it like a bit of a two-year-old, if you've got any two-year-olds or you've been around any, tell her what to do and it automatic, 
automatically pushes back. Yeah, so why is it that compliance doesn't drive behaviour alone? It's because of this, guys. Logic does not shape our behaviour as humans. Emotions do. Logic, the policies of Brazil just ticks off this bit. Yep, that'll make sense. It makes sense to wear PPE. Yes, it makes sense that I shouldn't swear at someone. It makes sense to go and speak to my manager. Yep, that makes sense. But we're emotional beings. And that's what drives our behaviour. Yeah. Stories, so the thoughts, the beliefs, will actually shift our perspective, yeah, the way we think about something. That perspective will then will have an emotional attachment to that and that we don't know that's happening. And that it's actually then that emotion that then drives our behaviour, gives us that leverage to then quit or, or change or do whatever it might be that we're trying to change. So in our organisations, if we're serious about trying to create great behaviour change, you know, people talk about culture change, change the stories, the narrative, that people are buying into, and that's when we start to see a change in behaviour. Let's go from being that safety enforcer where they have to do it, to perhaps try something different, be the safety storyteller where they want to do it. So the third question that you need to really get clear on with your teams is this, why? Why does safety even matter to us? And this is around getting a narrative for you, for your organisation that really is authentic. And it's not, guys, about reducing injuries. It's not about reducing the time off for LTIs. It's not about even increasing productivity, right? These things are outcomes. And they're great if it leads to that, but that's not why. Yeah. What we want to do is we want to share a compelling story, one that actually touches people's hearts, not their, just their heads. Part of what drives my actions and my belief in the need for a safe working environment is that um, quite some years ago, uh, one of my workmates was killed uh, in, a, in a workplace incident and um, I knew all of the people who were involved at the time. I saw the damage that was done to the customer's uh, business and the, and the people who were involved in there, the damage that was done to the business that I was working for where my friend was working. It had a huge impact on myself and uh, my family. It's extreme, um, but that very much drives my belief and my behaviour. So when we talk about share a story, it's got to come from our heart. You know, that's a, that's a really great example from Greg there about really speaking from the heart. So let's get our hands, both hands this time, yeah? And again, this one. In terms of asking that question, why does safety matter to us? We've got to be able to really touch people's hearts. Yeah, and it's got to really be authentic. So why does safety matter to us? Speak from the heart. Um, the really interesting thing with stories, we've heard a little bit about this today anyway, stories, you know, from a brain perspective, have the ability to change the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. It allows your team to have their own little aha moment. We're not telling them what, they're having their own insight. And that's why it starts to then create that behaviour change. The little mantra I say is this, logic makes people think, stories make people act. My final story that I'm going to share with you today is a, is a quick example of one of my clients. Uh, her name is Lauren and she's an area manager of a retailer. She, um, she basically was having this chat with me saying, Blythe, I don't know what to do. I, she has about 20 stores. And she says, for years, I just have this issue with my team. They just never, ever, ever are compliant with their safety reports, right? They have to do this report every month and it has to be on, based on the report from last, uh, on last month's safety stuff. She said, I've done everything. She said, they know, they've said to me, we know this is really important. We even know what to do. We know how to do it. She even went as far as saying, okay, if we don't do that, you're not going to get bonus, all that kind of stuff. She said, it's driving me crazy. And the team basically said, we're just too busy to do it. So it just goes down to the bottom of the pecking order. So I said to her, okay, cool. Let's maybe just try something different. And so I worked with Lauren on a quick story and she came up with the story to try to get them to go from having to do it to wanting to do it. I'll quickly sh share you her story. So Lauren went round to her stores and shared this story. She said to them, she said, look, you know what? When I was a kid, I hated zucchini. She said, I bloody hated it, but mum would always put it on my table and we, we could not leave that table until we ate that zucchini. She said, so I used to try everything to get out of it. She said, but I knew I pretty much had to eat the zucchini. So one time I thought, you know what? Just blow it. I'm just going to scoff the zucchini and then I'm going to see if I enjoy the rest of the meal. And she said, and that's, surprisingly, I actually enjoyed the rest of the meal. So she said to the team, you know, what if we did our safety reporting in a similar way? You know, you can't leave the table until it's done. So how about maybe we could try to eat that first? Maybe do it at the beginning of the month and then you can kind of cruise for the rest of the month. 
So she went around and told this story and then I caught up with her about a month later and she said, oh, I've seen about half the, half the stores and I've shared that story. And she said, and, you know, lo and behold, some of these reports have even been handed in early. She said, and even better, the team is starting to use this codification amongst them, going, have you eaten your zucchini yet? As their way of doing the reporting. Really, really simple sometimes, yeah? Logic tells, stories sells. Be a safety storyteller, guys. If we, you know, it can be personal like we heard from Greg, and that's got to come from our heart. Perhaps it's an aspirational story. Perhaps it's sharing an amazing success story that someone in your organisation is doing. Maybe it's an inspirational story of someone in a different organisation. Maybe it's a case study. Or maybe it's an educational thing where, you know, you're seeing what's happening in the industry and you want to share those stories. The key bit when we're sharing this stuff is not telling our teams what to make from it, but asking them this really simple question. What insight can we draw from that? And it's amazing what your teams will come up with. And that's when they start to actually go from being forced to do it to them being wanting to do it. Change the stories, we can start to change some of that behaviour within our organisations. And of course, finally, all this is, is in vain unless you, the leaders, are the ones leading the way. Because every single one of your team are always thinking this, or they're asking this, who's leading the way and are they actually serious? Do they say one thing and they do another? Because if that's the case, we might as well just forget all the other strategies, right? Always remember this, folks. People will do what you do, not what you say. People will do what you do, not what you say. And I just love this little clip um, that shows the passion of this leader. Buzz, I care about the guys on site. I really want to be able to go home each night and feel comfortable that we've done everything in our power to make sure that they have gone home safely. I care about my team. I'll do everything in my, in my power to make sure my team go home safely. When we're speaking and sharing stories, it's got to come from the heart. My question to you is, are you willing to continue to take that right road rather than the easy road? Are you willing to sometimes go from that safety enforcer role that, you know, sometimes we can fall into to move into that safety storyteller role? Because the safety enforcer will tell, the safety storyteller will build trust. The safety enforcer will set the rules. The safety storyteller will instill rituals. The safety enforcer is all about compliance. The safety storyteller is around coaching and sharing that compelling story. The safety enforcer is around people having to do it because they're forced to. The safety storyteller is about wanting to do it. So let's get up finally. Let's shake it off because we're going to just get up finally just because you've got about a minute between you and drink. So let's get up finally together, folks. Because, and follow with me, when you have, when you can be, let's, so we're going to follow with me with my hands, yeah? When your team can understand why, so let's all go to the heart and we can touch their heart, why safety matters, yeah? And they can understand, they know what the safety system is and they know what they're achieving. And then you've got the, they know how to do things and you minimise threats and maximise rewards, and you've got who, you, the leaders in the room who are prepared to take the right road, not the easy road, guys, that's when you can maximise performance. That's when you can optimise wellbeing, and that's when you will be successful in your safety quest. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's give it up for everyone here today for being such good players. Give me a slap. Um, thank you again to our conference organisers. Thanks for having me and have a fabulous night.